In what's been described as a milestone in ties, Chinese President Xi Jinping welcomes the Philippines president to Beijing. Hello, I'm Arnold Naidu in Washington, D.C., and this is The Heat. This week's state visit by the Philippines president marks a new beginning for China-Philippines relations. Chinese President Xi Jinping and Philippine President Rodrigo Duterte agreed that two countries will set aside differences over the South China Sea and work together to improve bilateral ties. The two sides signed 13 agreements covering trade and the economy, infrastructure, the fight against illegal drugs and maritime cooperation. We begin our coverage with CCTV's Wang Tongxian in Beijing. And Tongxian, China and the Philippines have just released a joint statement on President Duterte's visit. Was the dispute over the territorial claims in the South China Sea addressed? Yes, Anna, and the Asian neighbors agree that negotiation and dialogue is the most effective way to solve the maritime dispute on the South China Sea. And this is one of the major outcomes of Duterte's Beijing visit. A Chinese Vice Foreign Minister Liu Zhenming said the friendship between the both countries have now been fully restored and their cooperation will now enter a new phase. In China and the Philippines would also restore cooperation mechanisms on diplomatic consultations, defense and security consultation, and political party and congress exchanges. So a new chapter for bilateral ties, really. Anand. Dr. Chen, in an interview with CCTV, President Duterte said only China can help the Philippines. What's the potential for economic and political cooperation between these two countries? Well, a warmer ties between China and the Philippines are definitely encouraging for their economy. The Philippines can expect more Chinese tourists, and this will bring about estimated revenue of one billion U.S. dollars in one year. Also, this is predicted that bilateral trade will reach 60 billion U.S. dollars in five years and create some 250,000 jobs. Uh, furthermore, Manila has been invited to join China's Maritime Silk Road Initiative so it can benefit from regional economic cooperation. Uh, and it's more than just economic benefits. Both countries are now seeing a common waters with the South China Sea disputes. Um, they are looking at joint Coast Guard control to safeguard peace and stability in this region. This really gives China a good chance to make good on its argument that Asian diplomacy without intervention of outside parties can be win-win even for those who have territorial disputes. Anand. Now, China has supported the efforts of the new Philippine government in its fight against drugs, unlike the United States. What kind of assistance is China offering the Philippines? That's right. Beijing has promised to support President Duterte's battle against drugs through two ways, financial support and law enforcement cooperation. Duterte said about 4 million Filipinos are embroiled in illegal drug trade. To bring down the numbers, beside the harsh stance against the drug cartels and dealers, the Philippine government plans to build more rehabilitation centers. In November, there will be actually one opening founded by a Chinese businessman. And Tuturity's office also said China has committed more than 9 billion U.S. dollars in low-interest loans to the country. And about 15 million will go towards a drug rehabilitation program. So, Anand. Thanks, Tongxian. That's CCTV's Wang Tongxian reporting from Beijing. Joining us now from Manila is Richard Javed Haidarian. He's an assistant professor of political science at De La Salle University and the author of Asia's New Battlefield, the USA, China, and the Struggle for the Western Pacific. From Beijing, we're joined by Yang Xiu. He's a senior fellow at the China Institute of International Studies. And here with us in our Washington, D.C. studio is Michael Kugelman. He's a senior program associate for South and Southeast Asia at the Woodrow Wilson Center. Thanks a lot to all of you for joining us. Richard, here we have two countries that had some major differences only a few months ago. Now we have President Duterte going to yeah. Beijing. What's the significance of this visit? 
Well, in a very fascinating turn of events, within almost three months, the Philippines has gone from one of the fiercest critics of China, from a country that likened China to Nazi Germany on two occasions, now to a potential ally, or at least that is what President Duterte has been trying to say during his trip in China. Now, this trip in itself was highly symbolic. Why? Because usually Filipino presidents go to the United States or other major powers before they visit China. But for President Duterte, this is his first major state visit. And in fact, uh, initially it was Japan which was supposed to be the first state visit for him. But he bumped down the Japanese in favor of Beijing. But he will soon be in, in Japan. Nonetheless, huge, huge economic deals. Be, uh, around $13.5 billion of business deals uh, have been signed. $3 billion of infrastructure investment on the part of China. So he has a lot of economic goodies to bring home and try to portray China as a benevolent power. But the problem here is, what are the concessions he got in the South China Sea? Because while President Duterte said he doesn't want to bring up the issue because he doesn't want to rock the boat, for the Filipino people, that's the most important issue at this point in time. They want China to also show goodwill. They want also some compromise, at least in the Scarborough Shoals. Yang Xu, the Chinese President Xi Jinping has described this visit as a milestone. Let's uh, watch uh, part of what he said. Let's watch. I hope we can follow the wishes of the people from the standpoint of mutually essential and common interests and use this visit as an opportunity to push China-Philippines relations back on friendly footing and improve the relationship in all aspects. So, Yang Xiu, here we have two countries that just had a major diplomatic spat over territorial claims in the South China Sea. So, in that respect, how much of a reset is this for both countries? Well, uh, this visit uh, by Filipino president uh, will open a new chapter uh, uh, by the bilateral relation between China and the, the Philippines uh, because of two reasons. On one hand, the two sides ha uh, have determined to uh, conduct a, a wide range of comprehensive cooperations. On the, on the, uh, secondly, uh, the two sides uh, agree to uh, manage the difference on South China Sea issue in a proper way, at a proper level. Uh, at least uh, both sides agree the disputes or differences on South China Sea uh, is a tail, the bilateral relation as a dog. The dog should strike the tail rather than the tail strike the dog. That was the situation uh, Duterte's uh, predecessor made. So the two sides have determined to change the situation into the positive direction. Michael, the Philippines has been a long-standing ally of the United States. They have very close diplomatic ties, historical ties, as well as military ties as well. President Duterte's visit has been described as a rebalancing of Philippines diplomacy towards China. So what is the significance for U.S. strategic and political interests in the region? Well, it's absolutely huge because the Philippines is not just a friend of the United States. It's a critical alliance partner and ally for so many years, uh, a country that's been in a position to help project U.S. interests uh, across the Asia Pacific. And this being a region where the U.S. has in many ways been very absent for all this talk about the U.S rebalancing to Asia. It keeps getting distracted by things in the Middle East and elsewhere. Um, so the Philippines is really key. And what I was struck by was the reaction uh, from the U.S. government, from the, uh, the spokespersons in the State Department and the White House, where they seemed utterly shocked uh, about what Duterte had said about uh, separation from the U.S. and so forth. You know, you didn't have these U.S. government spokespersons come out there and say, well, we're going to work through this and we still value our relationship. There was just literal shock uh, in which, you know, you essentially heard these spokespersons say, we're going to need to get clarification on this. And I think there's going to be a very key visit uh, this weekend when a top U.S. official, Danny Russell, will be in, the Philo in Manila. And I think that he's going to hope to try to get that clarification then. Richard, you've written that, uh, uh, that by declaring a strong alliance with China, President Duterte is going against the Filipino people's inclination towards the United States. So in that respect, what's motivating this move by the Philippines president? Well, first of all, we are only talking about statements, not specific policy. We are yet to see whether the Philippine government will really move forward 
with quote-unquote separating itself with the United States and jumping into the Chinese camp. I really doubt that's going to happen, but that's the statement he has made. Nonetheless, those kinds of statements have not sat well with a lot of Filipinos. You hear a lot of sarcastic comments by Filipinos saying that the Sultan of Sulu has now visited the Ming Dynasty. That this, is not, this was not like a state visit, it was like a tributary visit. For many Filipinos, they felt the president was too differential to a very country that is occupying Philippine claim territories and preventing the Philippines from uh, enjoying sovereign rights within its own exclusive economic zone. So back at home, many people were raising their eyebrows, while in China, I noticed there was a very a positive pre uh, reception of the president. Now, he is going against the grain of public opinion if he really wants to move closer to China at the expense of U.S. There was a survey that came out just two days ago that showed the United States enjoys a positive 66 net approval rating. That means super majority of Filipinos still like the United States. This is one of the highest rates in the world. China has a negative 33 net approval rating, which means majority of Filipinos have a negative view of China. So he's not actually in sync with the public opinion, and that will put a lot of restrictions on how actually he can move forward with translating his rhetoric of separation into actual policy, not to mention his own cabinet members have tried to downplay his statement and to say that this is usual Duterte bravado, there's no guideline or specific instructions yet for us to move forward with an actual separation from the United States. Right, Richard, he might not be in sync with public opinion as far as this issue is concerned, but he still does enjoy 76% approval rating among the Philippines public. Yes, he is still in his honeymoon rates, so he's enjoying what I call honeymoon discount rates. He's popular. That is why he's still getting away with this kind of controversial statements, which has raised eyebrows among people. But the Philippine military and the security establishment will watch him very carefully. Uh, and for them, their relationship with the United States is extremely important. The U.S. has been a source of full-spectrum assistance to the Philippine military, logistics, finance, training, uh, a, a, among other things. So I think President Duterte will, will carefully consider the reaction of the Philippine political and security establishment when he really wants to translate his statements to actual policy. Nonetheless, I won't be surprised if President Duterte slightly downgrades security relationship with the U.S. by canceling any joint military exercises in the South China Sea and not to give American more access in Subic, Clark and other major bases facing, US, uh, facing South China Sea as a form of concessions to China and in exchange ask the Chinese to give him some concessions in the Scarborough Shoal and other contested areas in the South China Sea. So some slight downgrading in relations with the U.S. is more or less on the horizon. But completely sever separating from the United States, I think that was more hyperbole than actual policy statement. Yang Xiu, as far as the uh, South China Sea issue is concerned, uh, the two sides have issued a joint statement, was issued a short while ago, in which they've now agreed to resolve their differences through negotiation and diplomacy. In fact, the word that was used was consensus. What does that mean? Well, uh, for, from Chinese point of view, uh, we understand uh, the new uh, Filipino government uh, has uh, changed to the position uh, for solving this issue, disputes by negotiation, by bilateral negotiation with China, meanwhile, explore the ways for the joint development. That is a positive signal, a positive direction uh, supported by China. Uh, actually, for the long time, China has been calling for direct negotiation among the claimants, rather than the indirect parties like the United States, like Japan, to join the in. Uh, and meanwhile, China suggests China and ASEAN as a whole to negotiate and set up a DOC, a COC to guarantee the stability and the peace and the free, including the freedom of passage of this region. So by the two-track negotiations, we believe uh, we can achieve the peace and stability and the freedom passages. Uh, and uh, this uh, uh, visit by the uh, uh, Filipino president uh, uh, paved way for the uh, positive direction. Michael, we had the uh, arbitration court, the International Arbitration Court, recently rule in favor of the Philippines against China in this dispute uh, over the South China Sea. The United States had hoped to use that ruling to put pressure uh, on China to comply with it. Has President Duterte now undermined U.S. efforts to do that? 
Oh yes, I mean this is one of many reasons why this uh, this development is such a big blow for U.S. interests in this region, and particularly in the in the South China Sea context. Uh, but you know, I, I think it's important to make this point. For all we're talking about the impl the security implications, what this means for uh, territorial disputes and the like, I think that we really need to bring the conversation back to economics. I think that we need to be careful not to get caught up on what this means for the broader security implications of the region, just because I think at the end of the day, what the Philippine president is really concerned about here is, is economic support. Uh, the Philippines clearly needs a lot of such support, particularly for infrastructure. And I think the fact that uh, you know, there is so much money uh, coming out of this, so many claims of investments from the, the Chinese, it's a pretty big deal. The, China is simply willing to put more investments out there than the U.S. is, for example. And I think that uh, the, the Philippine president, I mean, he has a good reason. He, he's, I think he's very practical, in a sense. For all we talk about his bombastic rhetoric, yeah. he's very practical. And he understands the need to find the best possible economic partner to address these economic interests. So in that respect, Michael, do you agree with Richard there that as far as security relations are concerned, there will only be a slight downgrading in the relationship with the United States? I, I really think so, and particularly in the short term. For one thing, bureaucratically, it would just take a very long time to end these various defense agreements that the two countries have uh, with each other. It may take a few years, and by then you may have a different, uh, different leader uh, and, and, and so forth. But absolutely, I think the economics is the big thing, and the, the actual changes for security could be relatively limited. Just because I don't think the Philippines or the, the Philippine leadership really wants to end its security partnership with the United States, which simply wouldn't make sense. Okay, we're going to have to take a break right now. More of our discussion on China-Philippine relations right after that. Stay with us, you're watching The Heat. I, in this venue, Your Honours, in this venue, I announce my separation from the United States. In a speech to business executives in Beijing, Philippine President Rodrigo Duterte said it was time to say goodbye to the United States and hello to China. For its part, China says it's ready to work with the Philippines on infrastructure projects under the framework of the One Belt, One Road initiative. Let's get back to our panel. And Richard, uh, talking about this economic relationship, let's try to put some meat on the bones here. Um, what does the Philippines get from China if their economic relationship is improved? Well, first of all, let's put things into context. The United States is responsible for around 13% of total foreign direct investment stock in the Philippines. It's a huge source of investments, particularly in the realm of business process outsourcing, which has provided millions of well-paying jobs. China, in contrast, is only responsible for 0.1% of total foreign direct investment in the Philippines. So in short, the Chinese are just trying to catch up with the investment picture here. So even though President Duterte has signed around $13 billion of, trade, uh, of deals with China, China still has a long way to go before it matches countries like US, never mind Japan, which is even way more important to the Philippines economically. So this is not about like saying, oh, US cannot provide anything for the Philippines, let's jump, jump to China. It's more about the Philippines diversifying its investment relationship. Uh, so this is something that we have to keep in mind. Now, it is very true that infrastructure is a big problem in the Philippines. And when it comes to traditional partners like the United States, they have not been investing that much in Philippine public infrastructure. When it comes to Japan, they're willing to invest, but sometimes they're not as fast. Feasibility study take years. When it comes to China, we know they have this record of building fascinating f infrastructure in a very short period of time. We have seen it in Africa, Middle East, and Latin America. I think that is what Duterte has in mind. More specifically, Duterte is looking at China building a bullet train between Clark and Subic, which are going to be the alternative uh, traffic uh, hub for the Philippines. And crucially, those were the sites of American military bases during the Cold War. He also wants the Chinese to invest in the infrastructure and connectivity of Mindanao, his home island, where there has been very minimal investment by traditional economic partners. So this is very much diversification. And I believe that the entry of China into the Philippine infrastructure 
landscape in itself is a positive thing. Why? Because it puts pressure on Japan and other countries to also be more competitive and offer more. So expect President Duterte's visit in Japan in the coming days will also come along with a huge tag price whereby the Japanese will also try to match whatever offer the Chinese have been made. So in fairness to Duterte, he's playing these economic giants against each other to gain more investments for his country. Yang Xu, what are the benefits for China from this relationship economically? Uh, you know, China has initiated, uh, initiated uh, the one belt, one road. The Philippines can uh, play a very uh, important role for bringing about, uh, bringing about uh, the initiative. Uh, given his very important uh, location uh, in the whole picture. Uh, but uh, more broadly, uh, I think uh, uh, it seemed to me uh, the Philippines has been adjusting their foreign strategy from totally depending on U.S. towards multi-dimensional diplomacy. So his visit, uh, the presidential visit uh, to China is a starting point to the adjustment. Finally, we will see uh, the Philippines will uh, conduct uh, uh, the equal distance with, uh, uh, super power, with big powers like uh, China, U.S., and Russia, and Japan with a different uh, uh, focuses. For example, in security, I believe the Philippines uh, remain have a, uh, the closest ties with the United States rather than with the other power. But economically, they may have a closer ties with China than uh, with Japan. Now, uh, they, it's opposite, uh, let alone to with the United States. So basically, uh, the Philippines will, rel uh, will rely on different uh, uh, type of relations with dip different uh, powers. In this uh, multiple dynamics, I think China, on one hand, will successfully calm down the tensions on South China Sea. That is triggered by joint, uh, jointly by uh, Philippines and uh, the United States during the past. Now, Philippines turn around, and that will make uh, U.S. in a very difficult position, position for their continuity of the South China Sea strategy. That is the benefits politically from China. Economically, as I mentioned, we will uh, benefit it, uh, by cooperation for one belt, one role. Michael, what are your views on that? Do you also believe that the Philippines is involved in some kind of balancing act, delicate balancing act here to diversify its dependence on other countries economically? Absolutely, I think it is, and I, as it's, that's its right. I think that's a good idea. That's what it should do. This is a country with many needs, particularly in economics and other areas. So there's nothing wrong with trying to have it both ways. Maintain its, its very uh, good relationship with the United States, both economic and also uh, security related, but also try to get more. Uh, and particularly from the, uh, the Chinese who provide a particular comparative advantage and they can provide all these loans and investments for infrastructure, which as we've heard is a, is a very big deal. So in that sense, I think that this is a very uh, good plan um, by the Philippines. But I think that the ultimate issue here for the United States um, is to really realize that it cannot take for granted um, its policies in Asia. I think what, what, uh, sort of an indirect theme what we're seeing here is um, leaders uh, in Asia starting to wonder and worry how serious the U.S. really is about deepening its engagement in Asia with completing this rebalance, which we've been hearing so much about over the last few years. And I'm not saying that uh, Duterte, was, his, his objectives here were guided only by considerations of the U.S. not being serious about rebalancing. But I think it's important, particularly with the key presidential election in this country, thinking about po future U.S. policy in Asia and how serious the U.S. really is about engaging in this region so that it continue, can continue to have a significant role and be in a position where it doesn't need to worry about what's been happening um, with, with, with the, the Philippine president and his recent, his recent actions. Yeah, because economic relations notwithstanding, uh, President Duterte has used some pretty, well, let's say, undiplomatic language to the, towards the United States in general, towards President Obama in particular. Uh, and he's also said that the Philippines has gained little from its long alliance with the United States. Is he right? 
I can't see why that would be right, uh, given all of the, the support and the assistance that the United States has provided over the years. I do think that in s some of this, these things he's been saying is trying to play to the gallery, so to speak, um, cater to those in the Philippines that may be unhappy about any sort of perception that the Philippines is too dependent on the United States, even though, as we heard previously, uh, there's a tremendous amount of pro-American sentiment <coughs> in, in the Philippines, other than some, some fringe uh, representation, etc. So I do think that we, we we do need to take some of what he says with some uh, heaping grains of salt. Richard, it seems that President... Go ahead, you want to say something? Go yeah. ahead. Yeah, yeah. The thing is this. To be fair to President Duterte, of course, there's no excuse for expletives. And in fact, in this visit to China, we saw that he can be actually very statement-like. He had no expletives. He was very measured. He was very calibrated. So we know Duterte can actually behave himself like a statement. Now, going back to the United States, yes, the United States has provided indispensable support for the Philippines during humanitarian crises, like the uh, Haiyan crisis in 2013. But if you look at the military assistance that the U.S. is providing, it pales in comparison, way in comparison. When you talk about billions of dollars that e.g. Pakistan, Jordan, non-treaty allies, non-democracies that have been getting from the U.S., while well, the Philippines has been getting something around $70 million to $100 plus million. And not to mention some of them Vietnam era equipment. So there's a sense in the Philippines that, that it has been taken a little bit granted by the United States. Not to mention, when it comes to Senkaku Diaoyu, Obama made it very clear that's covered by the Mutual Defense Treaty. But he never clarified whether the Philippine claims in the South China Sea are covered by the Mutual Defense Treaty. So to be fair, I think Duterte is right when he says that the Americans have to be more clear about how far they're willing to support the Philippines in an event of conflict with China. Because if they're not willing to support us all the way, then let's make a deal with China. And this is what we're actually witnessing right now as he visited China and said all of those kinds of controversial statements. Yang Xiu, do you see the day when there'll be more involvement uh, at the military level between China and the Philippines? Uh, well, uh, at the starting point, uh, uh, in short term, I, uh, I cannot see the probability of the exchanges between male to male uh, between the two countries. But with the progresses of the wide range of corporations, I think uh, uh, it will, will be certain uh, to have a male to male uh, corporations between the two sides from non conventional area, security areas like. Uh, 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 cracking down criminal uh, transnational uh, criminal activities to uh, rescue uh, uh, disaster rescue and uh, gradually will uh, step into traditional security area uh, for the male to male cooperation say so in gradual way uh, we will step into the male to male relationship Richard, I've just got a little time left, but if we just want to look at one of the reasons why this rupture between the Philippines and the United States started in the first place, it was over U.S. criticism of President Duterte's anti-drugs policy. Um, yeah. Where is that going to go now? Well, first thing first, we have to accept that Duterte is a unique leader. He's one of the very few leaders in Philippine history who has been a self-described socialist, who has expressed criticism of U.S. time and again. When he was the mayor of Davao, he actually refused to grant Americans access to the Davao base for drone operations. So he has a history of tensions with the Americans, not to mention we heard his visa to U.S. was rejected a few years ago. So there are some personal tensions there and some conviction also for a more independent foreign policy. But I think when the U.S. really started to criticize him on the human rights and war and drugs issues, that's where I think he was really ticked off. But if the United States is more calibrated with its criticism of President Duterte, if it does it in a more private way, and in fact, if the U.S. tries to help him in the war on drugs, which is his pet project, and the Chinese have actually been helping him there by providing, for instance, the U.S. can provide assistance in terms of rehabilitation centers. 700,000 people have surrendered as drug users. What can you do with them? The only way to deal with them is creation of rehabilitation centers. And if U.S. helps there, I think we can contain these diplomatic tensions between Duterte and the Obama administration and probably even the next administration. Okay, and we're going to have to leave it there. Thanks to all of you for joining us. That is it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Arnold Nido in Washington, D.C. Thanks for watching.